Today's presentation is brought to you by the Transportation Learning Network. TLN is a program of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University and is a partnership with the four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, and the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes nine universities in Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Thank you to the MPC for providing the resources for this opportunity to research and deliver presentations like this. We certainly appreciate your support. Our speaker today is Dr. Ruzbe Gopchi. He is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at South Dakota State University. His research interests include pavement engineering, innovative transportation infrastructure materials, environmentally friendly pavement technologies, pavement performance, and asphalt materials. With that, Dr. Gopchi, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for the opportunity and also for the introduction. And I would like to thank everybody for attending today's presentation. So uh, I stopped the video here that we can go directly to the presentation. So today our uh, presentation is about uh, the cellulose on a fiber as an asphalt mix additive. So the organization of the presentation today will start with a short introduction and then we'll discuss about the objectives of the study, materials and methodology we discuss next, and then we'll talk about the results and uh, the conclusion that we have got from the study. So to begin with, the asphalt pavement and its impact is uh, cannot be ignored. So more than 94% of the paved roads in the US are asphalt concrete. Uh, 27 million tons of asphalt binder is produced per year and 4,000 asphalt plants, more than 4,000 asphalt plants produce 500 to 600 million tons of hot mix asphalt per year. So, however, the rising oil and gas prices and other concerns uh, related to environment and renewability, sustainability, leads the pavement industry to use more green pavement technologies, which have less carbon footprint, are less costly, and when we do a life cycle cost analysis, we will we find out that they are more sustainable than the other technologies. So some examples of the green paving technologies are warm mix asphalt, which can reduce the uh, pavement uh, uh, asphalt mixing and compaction temperatures and save in greenhouse gas emission as well as the fuel cost. Recycled asphalt pavements used in the new mixes which can reduce the need for the virgin asphalt and reduce the need for the petroleum uh, byproducts and also recycled asphalt shingles among other byproducts that can be used in asphalt and are becoming more and more uh, viable as well as uh, popular for the asphalt industry. So the, the asphalt mix uh, components include, of, uh, include mineral aggregates and asphalt binder. When they are mixed together, we get asphalt mix. However, uh, depending on many different parameters, the quality of the asphalt mix and its performance can be different. So some of the common distresses that uh, asphalt pavements experience are cracks because of the stripping, potholes, fatigue cracking, thermal cracking and rotting. So the, the factors which affect these distresses are whatever that goes in the asphalt mix, starting with the asphalt binder type, which also content and its chemical composition, physical, chemical, and mechanical properties of aggregates, and therefore how they interact with each other because the binding of asphalt binder to aggregate is of great importance when it comes to the performance of the mix. Also, uh, in, in terms of asphalt mix itself, all the volumetric properties of the asphalt mix, as well as its uh, air voice distribution and, and, and permeability, among other factors, affect the quality of the asphalt mix. <clears throat> Construction conditions, such as the temperature and how the crew are working, also affect the uh, the final product's quality. In terms of the use uh, phase, traffic loading as well as climate can affect the, the final performance of an asphalt mix. When it comes to asphalt binder, although it is five, almost 5% 5 of asphalt mix uh, composition, however, it plays such a crucial role 
in the performance of the mix. So performance grading of the asphalt, uh, when it was introduced, it was a revolution in the asphalt industry and how the asphalt point can be characterized. So the penetration uh, type of uh, grading was converted to more of performance grading. So it is in the, it is it includes high temperature and low temperature. So the high temperature of the PG grading is the average seven day maximum pavement temperature below which the pavement can and is expected to perform without significant rotting. And that for the low temperature is the minimum pavement temperature above which the, the, the pavement can perform without a significant concern about its low temperature cracking. So there are lots of different types of additives used in the asphalt binder to change and alter the high and low temperature PG grade of the asphalt, such as waxes, polymers, fibers, waste rubber, wrap, brass, polyphosphoric acid, and other oxidizers that are used uh, in the asphalt binder as modifiers. The most common asphalt binder modifiers that are shown to be very effective in uh, increasing the resistance to fatigue, also the, uh, the elastic recovery of the asphalt binder, and many uh, desirable uh, attributions of asphalt binder are the polymers, so such as elastomers, thermoplastic elastomers, and so on. And there are many different types of them in the market and are proven to be very effective. They can increase the high PG temperature and decrease the low PG temperature. And as a result, it can, it can expand the window of the high and low temperature PG range. However, although they are very effective, their cost is limiting their use. And if you want to have an as polymer modified asphalt pointer, we need to pay a premium for that. The other type of material that are used in the asphalt mixes are fibers. Fibers such as basalt fiber, polyester fiber, aramid fiber, asbestos fiber, which of course is banned, carbon fiber, and other types of fiber are used in the asphalt mix and have been shown that they can improve performance of the asphalt mix in many areas. More specifically, rotting performance is known to be positively or, or uh, desirably affected by using uh, fibers in the asphalt fine. Asphalt mix. These fibers, although are effective, they also add to the cost of the asphalt mix substantially. So, all of most of these fibers are expensive to produce, and also some of them are coming again from the petroleum products, which can add to the uh, final cost of the pavement. So, what uh, we are trying to Examine and we have looked into feasibility of using in this study what use of some cellulose byproduct. So, cellulose is the most abundant naturally occurring biomaterial in the nature. So, it is very cost effective because of it's very much available. It is reliable because we can uh, produce it as much as we want. It is renewable. We can get it from the crops and it is environmentally friendly. It has also been shown that uh, has very good mechanical properties, which we can benefit from its good and high mechanical properties, such as tensile strength as high as 60 megapascal and young modulus around 3 gigapascal are reported for the cellulose. So combining the, this cellulose concept with what we saw in the previous slide, uh, we can uh, we hypothesize that if we can convert cellulose to nanofibers, we can benefit from the reinforcing effect of cellulose nanofibers while uh, we skip the high price of the other types of fiber. So this was the motivation for this study. So to see, first of all, how can we produce cellulose fibers? And secondly, if the cellulose fibers are a good option or good alternative, to be used in asphalt mixes with two objectives, either to completely uh, replace other types of fibers or partially replace use of um, some of the polymers, which are costly. Therefore, the objectives of this study were summarized as follows. First, we, are trying, we were trying to produce 
cellular nanofiber or CNF in the laboratory using a technique called electrospinning that we will talk about it in a, in a little bit. Also, we want to investigate the effect of incorporating different amount of CNF by the rate of binder in three different types of asphalt binder. One of which is PG58-28. This binder is uh, widely used in the uh, northern states and upper Midwest area, for example, in South Dakota. Also, this binder is not polymer modified. We also try to have two different polymer modified asphalt binders. One of them PG64-34 and the other one PG70-28. So we want to see if, if we incorporate a different amount of CNF, what will be the changes in the fracture energies at low temperature by compacted isolate impact test? So I want to uh, put this explanation in the bracket that since we did not have a rheology lab, so we decided to go with another method to see what is the effect of using fibers on uh, low temperature performance. Since many different types of fractures uh, and cracks are directly correlated with the energy concept and absorbed energy, we decided to go with this path, uh, which I will show some slides about this test. The next step was to evaluate the effect of CNF uh, on dynamic viscosity of the binders. Uh, the other uh, objective was to evaluate the effect of incorporating three different amounts of fiber in three types of asphalt binders, as discussed above, on the adhesion and moisture-induced damage of damage potentials of those uh, aggregate binder systems using the binder bond strength tester. And uh, one important uh, uh, advantage of the binder bond strength tester is that we can test every couple of asphalt binder with aggregate individually so that we can spot any incompatibility between aggregate and binder before going to mix design stage. Uh, for, the, for example, PSR or Homburg test, they can capture the moisture damage, but they will not tell us which asphalt binder and which aggregate is not um, uh, incompatible. So this test is advantageous in that sense. And finally, we, uh, of, we, we aim to characterize the effect of incorporating different amount of CNF on the resistance of asphalt mixes to cracking, rotting, and moisture-induced damage in the mix level by conducting the semicircular band test, homebookable tracking test, and tensile strength ratio test. So here is uh, the study plan, which is presented in this uh, graph for workflow. And the first step was to produce a cellulose nanofiber. So with different try and error, and also reviewing the literature, we came up with the uh, optimum amount according to what we had in the lab. Uh, so what should be the uh, solution? What should be the concentration of the fibers in the, the raw material in the solution and so on? Binder aggregate adhesion test was conducted on all three binders with different amount of uh, CNF. For example, for PG58-28, we use 0%, 3.3% and 0.7% with gravel, with granite, and with quartzite. So for that, we used ash 2 t 361, which is uh, for the BBS testing. We repeated the same process for all binders. So uh, one step further, we also uh, tried to see what is the effect of binder type and CNF amount on the fracture energy. Same uh, test matrix was repeated, with the exception that we used more different types, more different amounts of fiber, including 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0.7. And we repeated that for all three different types of binders. And in the next step, we looked into the effect of uh, the amount and uh, amount of the CNF as well as the type of the binder on the dynamic viscosity by conducting a rotational viscometer test. Finally, we tested different types of different hot mix asphalts using the PG58-28 asphalt binder containing 0 0%, 0.3%, 0.7%, 0 0.7% CNF and we tested them in SCV, Humboldt Field Tracking, and TSR. So the first step was to know what should the solution as the raw material be for the production of the cellulose nanofiber. So we examined five different types of solutions, which uh, consisted of different uh, uh, the, the cellulose acetate as the polymer type, 
and different solvent types. For example, for the uh, solution one, we use only acetone, and solution two, we only use acetic acid. On the third option, we use acetic acid mixed with water, acetic acid mixed with acetone for the fourth option, and for the fifth option, we use acetone and water. So the concentration of the polymer by weight for each uh, combination is also shown here. Ratio of solvents are also shown here, which are the volumetry. And the total weight are also shown here. So we use always 25 grams of the solution. After testing them uh, for their tensile strength, as well as we did some SEM uh, scanning electron microscopy imaging, we found out that uh, for the material that we have, the solution number five uh, produces the highest amount of uh, tensile strength, plus the production of the fibers are more feasible. We don't get any clogging of the nozzle or problems like that. So we picked uh, number five solution combination for the rest of the project. So to give a little bit of background about cell uh, electrospinning, electrospinning technique is known for producing many different types of fibers by uh, the textile industry. So we use very similar uh, setup as shown, uh, the schematic of is shown here in this picture, and this is the setup that we have used in the lab. So the system consists of a high voltage power supply, which is connected to the metallic needle uh, tip, which is filled with a solution in a syringe, and it's connected to a syringe pump that it can discharge uh, some predetermined amount of uh, the uh, sol solution uh, by adjusting the syringe pump. And there is another metallic collector at the other end, which is connected, which is grounded. And then if you start to discharge this material from the syringe, because the particles are electrically charged, so there is a, a high difference in the voltage between the metallic collector and the metallic nozzle. So the particles start to fly from the tip of the nozzle to the metallic collector. In this process, the fibers are produced. The next step was to characterize the cellular nanofibers after production, because we wanted to uh, have a method for selecting which fiber are, 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 are which fibers are um, more suitable for our study. So the scanning electron microscopy was done and different images were collected. The next test was a running tensile strength test in order to find out what is the tensile strength of the fiber because that is one of the most important mechanical properties. For that purpose, we uh, took the collector which has the cellulose mat on it. So we call this a fiber mat, which is collected on the uh, on the collector. Then we folded the fiber mat several times until we can get a sample of given length and given width. So uh, the, the, previous, uh, the previous final length and uh, width of the sample was 36 centimeter by 12 centimeter on the collector. So we folded it as shown and more details are shown in a paper that I will uh, I will talk to you about at the end of the presentation. The other test that we did was uh, conducting isotendalium impact resistant test at minus 14 degrees Celsius, which is at low temperature. Uh, according to ASTM D256, although this test is not designed for asphalt binder, it is widely used for different types of polymers, such as plastics. So for uh, making a sample, for this testing, we needed to come up with a different type of arrangement of a metallic molds. So we ended up making metallic molds in the lab uh, with these aluminum uh, uh, aluminum pieces. So then we put them together. It consists of two end pieces, the beam bottom piece, and two side molds. When you put them together, it's very similar to the mechanism which is used on the BBR testing mold. So we made our own uh, from, from this material, and then we used, uh, we cut the uh, cellulose fibers to given length, and uh, uh, then we added that using a shear mixer in an oven. 
and then we molded those uh, asphalt binders until we get a sample like this shown here. According to the ASTM D256, there is a notch uh, with given uh, dimensions required in the middle of the sample that we can force the sample to fracture from that point. So we, we used a hot blade and another uh, metallic template that we can make the notch in the middle of the sample. So uh, we conducted the ISO impact test uh, using this equipment shown here. So this is a very simple equipment. It has the weight on the pendulum that it has a given length for the pendulum from, from the center to the center of the gravity of the weight at the end of it. And the sample was secured in, in the sample holder at the bottom in a jaw. And then the load was released by pushing a button. So there is a, a device that can measure the angle of this rod before an angle of the rod after passing and breaking the sample. So with measuring those angles, we can calculate the uh, corrected uh, absorbed energy value, which is calculated by the, the mass of the weight. And this one is G, which is the, uh, the gravitational acceleration. This is the length of the uh, this arm from here to the center of the gravity. Beta and alpha are the angles after and before uh, impact. And ETC is the energy total correction factor, which basically can be easily determined by running the machine without any sample in the job. The next test that we conducted was binder bond strength test. We used three different types of aggregate collected all from South Dakota. Uh, uh, the aggregate consisted of quartzite, granite, and gravel mineralogies. So we prepared the aggregate surface using a specific protocol that we used and we have described it in the report and also in the paper. So uh, we prepared the sample surface, then we used uh, these cool stops to uh, to, con uh, to to sandwich the asphalt point between the cool stop and the aggregate. So these cool stops are custom made in our machining lab so that they have a recess of about 0.8 millimeter that we can maintain always the same thickness of the asphalt binder according to Ashley P3361 standard test method. And finally, we use the piston, pneumatic piston to pull off these uh, pull stops from the surface of the aggregate. And the piston is shown here with the setup and everything that we used for pulling these samples and this equipment here measures the maximum force required for pulling the sample from the surface of the aggregate. From that force, we can measure what was the tensile strength. Also, after conducting the test, we took an image of each failure surface and we analyzed the image to see to what extent the failure mode is adhesive or cohesive. In the asphalt mix uh, study, we prepared an asphalt mix with a given uh, mix design. The, the mix that we prepared was a PG58-28 asphalt binder uh, containing 4.8% virgin asphalt uh, cement and 20% wrap. So the wrap uh, binder, which replaced about 1% of the virgin binder, total binder, uh, is is very important. We use 20% wrap because use of wrap is becoming more and more standard practice for the pavement industry. So the mix met the VMA, VFA, and dust proportion requirements according to the ASHTO M323 uh, procedure. This is the gradation of the aggregates as you can uh, see in this image. Uh, and uh, maximum uh, maximum nominal aggregate size, nominal maximum aggregate size was found to be about half an inch. All the samples uh, for the testing were prepared as 7 plus minus 0.5% air void to represent the asphalt mix layer right after compaction. So different types of tests were conducted on the asphalt mixes. The first one was the semicircular bend test. Uh, this is a standard procedure. We followed the Louisiana method, which is according to ASTM D8044. Uh, to begin with, we compacted the samples, then we used the rock saw to cut the samples to the, uh, to the 
geometry required by the ASTM standard, and then uh, we prepared the semicircular specimens by cutting them from the middle, and then we made notches of one, one and a quarter, and one and a half inches depth, and we used a asphalt mix performance tester, performance tester to test them in the lab. So as you can see here, this is, this is a sample that is uh, being tested. And here, uh, this is a typical load deformation curve set for different notch depths. So from these sets, we can calculate the strain energy at failure by calculating the area under the curve up to the peak load, as shown with this blue area. So that is called U in this equation. So the variation of the U, which is strain energy, with the notch depth divided by the thickness of the sample is uh, is called critical strain energy release rate or G integral, which we will call you in this presentation. So here are some samples after testing. You can see the ligament that after failure, and this is the notch uh, on, on the on the same sample, and this is the sample before failure. So with this test, we can initiate a crack on a predetermined location on the sample, and then we can measure the susceptibility of the sample to the crack propagation. Uh, using the J integral. High, the higher the J integral means that the sample is more resistant to, uh, to cracking. Of course, uh, if we want to complete the uh, evaluation of the mixes, crack after cracking, we need to know if the sample is not too soft because the soft uh, asphalt mixes are resistant to cracking. However, they don't do very well in the Humbergville tracking or the rocking performance. So we conducted the uh, Humbergville tracking or SWT test according to ASHTO T324 on the, on the asphalt mixes uh, as shown on the sample as shown. And in, in the cases that we saw an abrupt change in the rocking uh, slope, we found out the stripping inflection point, which is a representation of starting of the stripping mechanism so uh, we use that SIP value for uh, evaluating our mixes uh, with respect to the resistance to motion use damage. Last but not least, this, uh, we conducted the tensile strength ratio test according to ASHTO T283. This is one required test according to the SuperTAVE uh, procedures for the mix design. So we conducted the test according to standard. We moisture conditioned the sample. We had two sets. We uh, ran the indirect tensile strain test in an MTS equipment using the specific jig for a six inch sample. And uh, from that, we found out what is the tensile strength of the sample before and after moisture conditioning. And with, with averaging those uh, tensile strength in dry and wet condition, we found the tensile stress uh, tensile, uh, tensile stress ratio, basically, TSR value. So uh, here we can summarize the, the test result that we have got from testing our samples. So the first uh, test result that I would like to discuss is the uh, results of the SEM imaging. So on the left-hand side, you can see the SEM imaging of the uh, number five uh, solution, which was 88% by volume acetone and 12% by volume uh, distilled water. Also, we use 17% by weight uh, cellulose acetate uh, in the mix. So after electro spinning, we have got uh, some sample and then we put it in, in the SEM imaging machine. And what we can see from this picture is that, uh, from the picture on the top, is that the fiber structure is similar to that observed in non-woven fiber. So it is easily uh, seen that it is not directional. So the orientation of the fibers are uh, relatively in a random orientation. So we would not call this a directional fibers. So they, they, they don't have any distinct orientation in the image. Also, uh, the, the CNF filament, which is another picture, uh, another uh, basically 
uh, SEM image of the same picture with a higher resolution and higher um, uh, magnification, you can see that what is what is the filament of cellulose nanofiber look like. So uh, the filament is uh, relatively consistent. It has a relatively consistent structure. Also, the cross section of this uh, is relatively very similar to elliptical, but more like a rectangle and it has soft edges and it's a smaller cross-sectional uh, dimension is approximately about 67% uh, of its larger cross-sectional dimension. And this is pretty much consistent. We use uh, some uh, imaging, uh, image analysis uh, software in order to extract more data from these images. And uh, on the graph to the right of the slide, you can see the distribution of different diameter ranges of the cellulose on the fibers that we have produced in the lab. Uh, relatively, uh, samples were consistent by looking at different micrographs on SEM. We were able to uh, confirm that samples were relatively consistent in terms of their diameter. Uh, but also, we need to add uh, the variability in the imaging because sometimes the orientation of the fibers can hinder very uh, accurate uh, imaging, uh, image, image analysis. So this is the data that we have got from the data. We can observe that mostly the, the diameter of the fiber most uh, frequently was around 11 micrometer. More precisely, if I want to give you the diameter, the diameter was found to be about 11.888 micrometer with a standard deviation of 2.939 micrometer. Also, the minimum and maximum fiber, fiber diameters were found to be 4.029 and 23.013 micrometer, respectively. The next step was to determine the tensile strength of the fibers. So, uh, sample, uh, samples were tested in the x and y direction. So, the image to the right of this, to the left of the slide shows the a typical type of uh, tensile force versus strain for the CNF tested in the X and in, in Y direction. So from the testing, samples tested in X direction showed an initial slope, which was higher than that of the one tested in the Y direction. Uh, and we have seen this common trend on almost all of our samples. So uh, the direction of the sampling was found to affect its uh, tensile strength as well as its uh, initial stiffness for a young modulus to some extent. So uh, also uh, we found out that uh, it is expected to have a higher modulus of elasticity in X direction. And also from the other figure, which is the figure to the right of this slide, it can be concluded that uh, for the average tensile strength that we have got, in X direction was relatively higher than that that we have got in the Y direction. It can be related to several uh, different types of parameters. One is that which part of the sample is taken from that sample collector. So from the center of the collector, we observe that we are taking more dense samples. And from the sides of the collector, which has more, which have more distance from the tip of the a dispenser, we collect the samples which were less strong. So that, that, that's something that uh, we observed uh, in, in the CNF production. However, uh, average tensile strength at failure was higher in the Y direction. So in the Y direction, samples were able to uh, sustain more strain before failure. So which was an interesting observation. The next test that we conducted was a dynamic viscosity test. And from a dynamic viscosity test, we can see that addition of cellulose nanofiber, regardless of the type of the uh, control asphalt point or region asphalt finder, always resulted in higher dynamic viscosity. For example, for the CNF amounts used in the PG58-28, at the 0%, we are getting 125 uh, millipascal second when tested at 167 degrees Celsius. And with addition of some, somewhere around 0.3% CNF, we can see 
a, a higher amount of dynamic viscosity. But one important observation was that these uh, improvements in the dynamic viscosity were more pronounced when we test the sample at the lower temperature. Also, these were more pronounced when we were using uh, asphalt binder, which was not polymer modified. For example, if you move to the right, which we are looking at PG64 minus 34 and PG70 minus 28 asphalt binders, we can see the slope is almost consistent. So, uh, and the slope is much higher in the uh, dynamic viscosity. I'm not telling this because of the picture, but if you look at the percent improvement, because the picture, uh, the, I'm sorry, the graphs are not plotted with the same scale, but if you look at the percent improvement in dynamic viscosity per CNF amount, you will observe that uh, it is more effective when you are using a non polymer modified asphalt binder. Next step was to look into the variations in the fracture energy as a result of adding different amount of CNF in uh, different types of asphalt binder. This is a very interesting graph. Uh, so uh, we are just trying to make sense of what we are seeing here. So to begin with, we've observed that for the 0% fiber, we are looking at region asphalt binder. Let's say how the fracture energy of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the asphalt binder will look like. So fracture energy is lower for PG58 minus 28. So when we use PG64 minus 34, it goes up. And another level up, we use PG70 minus 28. So it seems like this test can capture the, uh, the, the difference in the PG grades. So and higher, it means that the higher PG grade is used. So when we added 0.2% cellulose on a fiber to PG58 minus 28, we were able to uh, get some average fracture energy, which was almost equal to 0% fiber in a PG64 minus 34. With increasing the amount of fiber, we were able to see, for example, with 0.3% CNS in PG58 minus 28, we were able to get an average fracture energy of that of PG70 minus 20 without any fiber. So this is a very interesting observation, but before doing a full rheology test and doing a high temperature PG grade and a low temperature PG grade, uh, we cannot 100% uh, judge to see if this test is capable of 100% telling us uh, what we can get from adding fiber. At that point of time, we didn't have this uh, asphalt binder lab, unfortunately, now we have a new established asphalt binder lab. This is the next thing that we are going to look at and find out okay, how well the results of the fracture energy from the ISO impact test can be correlated with uh, different rheology tests such as um, BBR, DSR, and uh, maybe MSCR tests. Next uh, here is the asphalt binder adhesion test results. So using the DBS test, uh, from uh, this, this slide shows the adhesion results for uh, the asphalt binders with granite. These three show the PG58 minus 20 granite. The other three shows uh, 64 minus 34 with the same aggregate and that of PG70 minus 28. So the lighter bars show the average uh, pull off a pull of strength or POS drive, and the hatched bars show the average POS for the moisture conditioned sample. Also, these triangles, the green triangles, show us the pull up strength ratio, and that is the average uh, moisture condition POS divided by drive uh, POS value. It is very similar to the TSR values as we. Uh, as we divide the tensile strength in the moisture condition to the dry condition. So starting with the PG58 minus 28, we can observe that uh, the PSR values increase with uh, addition of CNF. Not necessarily higher amount of CNF resulted in higher amount of PSR value. What we were able to see was that the moisture condition plus strength of the samples were improve, improved by addition of higher amount of CNF in them. The same trend was also observed when PG64 minus 34 was used. However, in PG70 minus 28, 
the same frame was not observed, but the one important point that uh, we can observe from here is that the error bars are too high for some of them. So maybe statistically, we are not capturing the representative uh, average value. So, but what can, can, can be said is that dry, uh, dry, P, dry POS values reduced by addition of the, uh, addition of the CMA. This trend was different when the PG64 minus 34 was used, which the dry values went up. Overall, it can uh, be concluded that we did not see too much of uh, adverse effect of adding CNA to the asphalt finder on its occasion to granny. Another important parameter that uh, we need to always uh, take a look is the mechanism uh, at which, uh, under which the, the failure happened. So uh, on the, in these two, these two graphs show us the mechanisms of the failure. These yellow graphs show that what percent of the samples failed cohesively and what percent failed adhesively in adhesion. And here on the blue chart, you can see the same for the moisture condition sample. So interestingly, we can easily see that when we moisture condition the sample, the uh, failure mechanism start to shift from mostly cohesive to mostly adhesive. So here we can see that non-polymer modified or unmodified, unmodified asphalt binder was more susceptible to the adhesion loss due to the moisture damage. And that adhesion loss increased by addition of the CNN. So, however, in the PG64 minus 34, we started to see that uh, the adhesion loss was much less than that of non-polymer modified asphalt binder. However, moisture conditioning affected the increase of the adhesion loss. Same was observed more or less for the PG58 minus 20. A similar graph is uh, presented for the quartzite type of aggregate. And for the quartzite, consistently for non-polymer modified or unmodified asphalt binder, we were able to see that dry condition samples lost their adhesion. However, uh, the rate or PSR value did not change too much from one to another when the low amount of CNF was used, but at high amount of CNF, uh, the, the adhesion increased. Interestingly, the moisture conditioning was found to increase the tensile strength, so which is a very interesting observation because we can see that the PSR values start to go above one, unlike the previous aggregation. A very uh, desirable trend was also observed for PG64 minus 34, increase in the PSR value. Also for the PG70 minus 28, after a heat up of 0.3% CNF, we again started to see that the PSR value increased. But overall, all the PSR values for all the samples containing CNF were more than one, which uh, is an indication of a good adhesion. So, the same chart for the adhesion mechanism and the cohesion mechanism, we can see that uh, after moisture conditioning, an increase in the adhesion, adhesive uh, failure was observed. However, it, is not, it was not very much, um, it was not very significant compared Dr. to- Dr. Gopchi? Yes. Um, can you just scoot a little bit closer to your computer? Your audio is kind of fading out. And then there, was a, there was a question, was uh, the 7028, is that non-modified? No, it is modified. It is modified. Okay, thank yeah, you. PG70 minus 20, it is modified. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I have not uh, looked at the chat box. Okay, can you hear me better? A little bit better, yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the same graph for the gravel, and the gravel aggregate uh, behavior in the adhesion was very much similar to that of the quartzite uh, type of aggregate. So I'm not going to go over it because we have more slides to cover and uh, we are running out of time. So uh, when it comes to asphalt mix characterization, we started with the uh, SCB test, but uh, I would like to just underline the fact that we only did testing for PG58 minus 20 asphalt mixes. So we did not uh, make asphalt mixes for other types of asphalt binders. So with testing uh, the, the, the asphalt mix, we observed that 
significant improvement in the JNR value by addition of the fibers. So the JNR values increased uh, from 0.53 for 0% CNF, 0.72 with 0.3% CNF, and 0.982 for 0.7% CNF, which is a significant increase. Uh, also, 0.53 is higher than 0.5, which the same mix passes the requirement for the JNR value to begin with. The other test that we conducted was a resistance to rotting and stripping using a Hamburgville tracking device. So again, the same type of the mixes that we tested in the uh, in the SCB were examined. So this yellow line shows the control mix, which has 0% CNF in it. The, the blue line shows uh, the mix containing 0.3% CNF. And the red line shows the mix con containing 0.7% CNF. Again, from both graphs, all three graphs, all three uh, curves, we can see that both mixes containing 0.3 and 0.7% CNF did better than the control mix, which did not have any CNF in there. Also, a slipping inflection point of 11,355 was observed for the 0% CNF. However, the SIP values both were higher for the mixes containing some amount of CNF in them. And mixes were more or less ranked uh, with the order of the amount of CNF when it comes to their resistance to rotting. So from this graph, we can observe that both rotting and moisture-induced damage resistance improve with addition of CNF. Finally, here uh, are the results of the TSR test. From the TSR test, it can be observed that the dry samples uh, tensile strength improved with addition of CNF. However, the, when we move from 0% CNF to 0.3% CNF, the moisture condition tensile strength reduced a little bit. And then again, it increased after addition of 0.7% CNF. So it is important to note that only looking at the TSR value may not be a very good uh, representation of the moisture induced damage because this result that we are looking at here is not 100% consistent with what we have seen from the Hamburgville tracking test. So uh, there are some, uh, the Hamburgville tracking test has more mechanistic nature, not 100%, than the TSR, with the, which, which has less mechanistic nature. However, the lower TSR value is partially uh, because the dry strength increased. So that, that we should take these results with a grain of salt. So as the conclusions of this study, if, if I want to summarize uh, the conclusions, uh, first of all, we found out that electro spinning method is very flexible, easy to use, quick, cheap, scalable a method for production of CNF fibers. We got consistent diameter as well as uh, shape and texture of the fibers as a result of SCM study. Also, the previous CNF were found to have tensile strength values. Uh, which in average was uh, about 10% different when we tested in two different directions. The strain at failure uh, in, in different directions were also different by 3%. Incorporation of the CNF in asphalt binders was found to increase the uh, dynamic viscosity. It in terms results in a need for increasing the mixing and compaction temperature. So here maybe there is a potential of using some warm mix asphalt additives in production of mix to improve the compatibility of the mix in the field and getting good density results. The uh, next conclusion was that the effect of addition of CNF to asphalt binder on increasing their viscosity was more pronounced at lower temperatures for all binders and more prominent in non-polymer modified binder at all temperatures. Next, the absorbed fracture energy determined by the conducting the isotendelium impact test was introduced as an innovative adoption of an existing method for a quick, quick characterization of asphalt binders resistant to cracking. Also, also it was found that uh, the effect of addition of CNF was, uh, the, the test was able to discriminate the effect of addition of CNF <clears throat> on asphalt binder. So, but however, uh, more study is needed to be done to see how this test can characterize asphalt binder when comparing the results of it to real, uh, the, the rheology of asphalt binder. Uh, number six, the result of the VBS test or adhesion test indicated that overall improvement in adhesion was achieved when the CNF was used. 
Resistance of asphalt mix to cracking was found to significantly improve as a result of incorporating CNF. Also, this uh, use of CNF in mixes was found to reduce the susceptibility of, the, of mixes to rotting and moisture damage. And the TSR results did not 100% match the findings of the uh, Hamburg wheel tracking results. Um, some recommendations for the future study is First, to study the effect of CNF on PG and MSCR grades of asphalt binder. Uh, this, is, this is the part of the study that we are right now working on it, but it is beyond the scope of the project, so we are pursuing it independently from the project. And uh, some study, uh, study of other variations of electrospinning parameters, such as uh, different voltage, different distance of the tip to the collector, and different combinations of uh, uh, solvents is required to be done. Uh, or recommended to be done. In case of terminal blending, if you want to, if you want to really use it for making some test section, the storage stability of the CNF modified asphalt binder is strongly recommended to be studied because we don't want a phase separation in the asphalt binder if it is modified by the CNF. That's another study that needs to be done. Also, a different study is recommended to pursue to establish a solid basis for validation and interpretation of the ISOP test in the context of characterization of cracking potential mass asphalt mixes. More details of this study is already published, uh, are already published in, uh, in, the, in this, uh, and the, the information of which can, is given in this citation. So, yeah, I think uh, I, I'm good <laughs> with, with the time we have almost five minutes. I would like to thank everyone for the attention. Also, I would like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of the MPC as a sponsor of this study, the North Central Sun Grant, and uh, South Dakota State University Asphalt Binder provided Jebro Company and uh, Concrete uh, Materials Companies for the donation of materials and technical assistance. Dr. Gabchi, thank you very much. Um, I, there was, I think we clarified uh, that maybe there was a little bit of a um, error with that question of the 70 minus 28 being non-modified. So it, it was modified and that is that is verified, correct? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. all right, that, thank that's you. Right. Okay, I'm thank sorry. you. I was, I was using the camera as a mic, so. <laughs> okay, if anybody has any additional questions, go ahead. I can elaborate on that question. Like I said, I. It was confusing, but when you were talking about um, the binders that were more, that were the failure of the wet conditioned specimen was, was moving over to cohesion, you were pointing to the 7028 and saying that the non-modified binder oh, sorry was failing that. in cohesion. And okay. so is that slide not okay. right? Go on the slide, maybe that can be helpful. So we are talking about yes, right here. That's PG oh. seventy twenty eight, and you're saying that you were saying that the non modified binder was failing more in adhesion. Oh, so is, so is that no switch? No, that I I have misspoke actually. That that's not the case. Thank you so much for the correction. Okay. Also, at the end of the presentation, uh, Chris, if you will, I can add one more point. If uh, you want more materials or if you want me to share some uh, some information or data with you, please feel free to shoot me an email at rulebet.gopchi at sdstate.edu. I have provided that email address at the very beginning of this presentation. So it's right here. So, yeah, I will be more than happy to give more clarification or more information if you Okay, I also put a link in the in the chat and that link takes you to the landing page for this research project on the MPC website, uh, which is part of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute, one of our partners with TLN. So if you want additional information, feel free to go ahead and uh, click there and Dr. Um, Gopchi's information is in there as well. All right. Uh, if there are no additional questions, thank you guys for attending today's TLN event. We certainly appreciate your time and attention. Uh, Dr. Ruzbe Gapchi, thank you so much for sharing your information. Good luck with finalizing that, that project out. Um, I sincerely hope everyone enjoyed and gained some new knowledge from today's session. I encourage you to visit our website at translearning.org for upcoming learning opportunities and to access learning management system. 
If you see a topic out there that is of interest to uh, you or your peers, please do share that. Uh, we believe sharing is caring. So the more information we can get out there, the better for everybody. Uh, with that, have a fantastic week. Be safe and don't forget to be awesome. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.